Montgomery here for the Oberlin event. Yes, we are. Wonderful. Thank you very much. There you are. You got the email. Now you start introducing the noise or the problems. Welcome. I'm Marvin Krislov. I'm the 14th president, and it's my privilege to welcome you to this discussion. Um, we think this will be a very interesting discussion. We have great panelists. I want to say a few remarks before we begin. This event was organized as part of Oberlin Illuminate, our comprehensive campaign to build a great future for our college and conservatory. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce some new and newly promoted members of our leadership team who are helping us shape the future. Tim Elgren is here tonight. He will be our new Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences beginning in July this summer. He comes to us from Hamilton College where he has been a professor of chemistry and associate dean. Um, Tim? Also, they're not with us tonight. Um, Andrea Kalin has been appointed as our new Dean of the Conservatory. She was the acting dean and has also been the associate dean, and she's doing a wonderful job already. And we just announced the appointment of our new Vice President for Finance and Administration, Mike Franson, who has been serving as interim president of Albion College for the past eight months, and before that, he was the chief financial officer there. Um, I also want to acknowledge some Oberlin trustees who are with us this evening. Chris Canavan, class of 84. Um, David Krischer, is David here? Yes, where's David? David, where are you, David? I don't see you, David. Okay, well, David thinks he's here. We think David's here. Okay, he's up there. Behind the camera. David, where are you? I can't see you. Anyway, class of 70, is he behind Leon? Okay, he's here. David, I'm glad you're here. I can't see you, but I'm glad you're here. Tom Cutson is here, class of 76, and Chesley Maddox Dorsey is also here, um, class of 81. Where's Chesley? And Tom Cutson, I recognize. Tonight's topic is particularly apt because the relevance, cost, and value of a college education, especially a liberal education, are hot topics today in the media, in politics, in our society. We have invited a panel of esteemed experts to address a question that is critical to our mission and success. Is a liberal arts degree still worth it? Of course, I have a bias here. Um, I believe it is. On personal and professional levels, I've benefited immensely from studying the distinctive blend of the humanities, sciences, and arts that is the essence of liberal education. I, of course, have done so and continue to believe in it because I think it is the best preparation a young person or even a not-so-young person can have for life. Our mission is to educate the whole person rather than training graduates to succeed at specific jobs employers may be seeking to fulfill at a particular point in time. The Illuminate campaign will help us build on that future. Our goal is to raise at least $250 million by 2016. I'm happy to report that thanks to the efforts of many, many of you in this room, we have raised more than 215 million. We still have a lot of work to do, especially in raising money for things such as scholarships and financial aid, which is the single biggest bucket in the campaign. Ensuring that Oberlin remains diverse, inclusive, and accessible and to people from every socioeconomic circumstance is crucially important to us. We currently provide around $60 million in financial aid to our students. That number has grown every year since I became president in 2007, and we expect that number to continue. Access and affordability are the two key issues faced by Oberlin and all colleges, especially those selective colleges in America. 
We are very fortunate tonight to have with us four people who have a tremendous amount of expertise, experience, and broad, deep knowledge of the issues facing higher education. I'm also pleased to say that I count all four of them as friends, so it's really wonderful to see you all here tonight. In the interest of time, we've agreed to very brief introductions. You will find fuller biographies in your program. Starting to my left is Dr. Sandy Baum, who is the Research Professor of Education Policy at George Washington University and Senior Fellow of the Urban Institute. Next to her is Richard Colvin, class of 76, who is the visiting fellow at the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation and is a well-known journalist on these topics. Next to him is Jamie Studley, Deputy Undersecretary of Education and Acting Undersecretary of Education, former president of Skidmore College and good friend of mine from my law school days as well. And next to her is Jean Tobin, who is Program Officer for Higher Education and the Liberal Arts Colleges at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the former president of Hamilton College and representative of the foundation that is probably the best friend to liberal arts colleges in America, the Mellon Foundation. So we're very glad to have you as well. So I will start off and then I will sit down, um, which is by asking the fundamental question, what do we think the value of a liberal arts education is? And what kind of value should parents and students be looking for in a college, particularly a liberal arts school? And we'll start, we'll go in the order that you're seated, and then we'll mix it up. So, Sandy? Uh, a liberal arts education is certainly still worth it, and I suspect there's a lot of consensus about that in this room. So it's not really a matter of convincing people here. It's a matter of thinking to ourselves how we can articulate this, especially in an environment where there's so much focus on how much money are you going to earn, and how do you maximize your earnings. And I think that that's symptomatic not just of how we think about higher education, but of our society, and partly because of the strain that people are under, because the economy is not good, because the reality is that if you're going to go to Oberlin, even though you're not going to maximize your income, it's expensive. And you really want to make sure that it's a reasonable investment and you're not going to be unemployed for the rest of your life, even though that's not the reason you're going. But I think that we all have a big responsibility to help people understand that, in fact, learning to think, learning to communicate, learning to be a good citizen, learning to relate to other people and to be curious, learning to solve problems is not separate from being successful throughout your life and successful in the labor market, it's a critical part of it. And we know that if you go to Oberlin, you come out hoping to achieve a lot of different things. You want to earn enough money, you don't want to maximize your income. But, you know, people who just decide to learn something very specific, if they don't know how to be flexible, how to think in different contexts, then a couple of years from now, when that specific job disappears, they're going to be in a mess. So I think, and I think most of us would like our children to grow in themselves and learn to think and become happier, more satisfied, and better human beings. And an education is the best way to do that. Well, uh, I have to warn you that I've been instructed by Marvin and his staff that my role here tonight is to be a skeptic. And so, um, I want to start off by saying Oberlin was the best experience I've ever had in my life. If that doesn't sound skeptical enough, it's because for me personally, um, everything that I learned at Oberlin, and I'm not talking so much about knowledge and content, but it's about how to be in the world, how to have ideas, how to interact with others, how to learn, all of these things um, have been crucial in my vocational experience, which is, as Mar uh, Marvin said, for 30 years I've been a journalist. Most of that time I've written about education because I do believe that education is incredibly valuable to us as a society and as a community. Now here comes the skeptical part. Um, a guy named Louis Menand, who is an English professor at Harvard, he made the statement that liberal arts is, any, is, it, is that anything that's vocational is by definition illiberal. <laughs> um, 
I think a lot of parents who are plunking down a significant amount of money, thinking that none of this has anything to do with being uh, successful financially or being able to move out of your parents' basement, for, one, for God's sake, that, that, is not a, that that's not relevant. So I think the challenge, as Sandy said, is for liberal arts people to say, um, and, and it's interesting, I'll, I'll interrupt myself to say, most recently, the organizations that promote liberal arts have said, no, actually, liberal arts education is a vocational preparation. So they've, you know, turned it around and saying, you know, it really does prepare you for the world, and I do believe that. Um, so I think the challenge, as Sandy said, is to say uh, liberal arts does all these wonderful things. It is also vocational. And the, the other part of it, I'm going to say, and I'll keep coming back to it all night, it doesn't, liberal arts education doesn't have to only be delivered on a campus that looks like the campus that we all have in our dreams uh, of, you know, ivy and a big open quad and dorms and and all of those sorts of things. You can get a liberal arts education many, many different ways, and um, that's not to say liberal arts colleges shouldn't exist. It's to say that we need to be open-minded about how we deliver that education. I think you're going to have a little sense of an echo effect, uh, not just from the microphones, but from the uh, values that we uh, reinforce here. Uh, let me take this part of it. I think liberal education's most important uh, focus is to prepare the people who will have to deal with the questions we can't yet even identify and articulate. Uh, I'll start with a story. When I was president of Skidmore, the development staff uh, had run out of rich people for me to meet when I was in San Francisco once, so they arranged for me to meet with two very interesting young people, giving away some of the secrets. Uh, one of them said, I knew I wanted to work in computers, so it was quite natural for me at Skidmore to major in philosophy. And he said that the people he worked for in his cool startup company in San Francisco said, when we need a particular kind of programming, it's better for us to turn to somebody who knows that specific program. And you don't. But when we have a question that nobody's seen before, we ask you to do it, Ian. And I've always remembered Ian as a terrific example of what we mean by the ability to tackle new things, draw on experience, draw on education, draw on other people and other kinds of knowledge uh, to, to deal with the new and have the reflective ability to process and, uh, and cope with that kind of uncertainty on both a personal project level and a national and global level. So let me add another layer into what people are talking about here. Perhaps one of the worst things that higher education ever did was start to quantify the added value of a college degree. That, you will make a million dollars more if you go to college, is, has haunted us in terms of the way people think about what mm. you get from college. And it makes it all a personal advantage. You will make more, you mm -hmm. and your family will have more money. When what's tremendously important is what will be the community good? How will you be able to add to our capacity to resolve big problems? Um, at a time when too many people don't know how to talk and think and uh, address shared issues across differences, and we say that it's a fundamental value of liberal education to learn how to do that, how to understand people who have different perspectives, different experiences, different subject area, but also different ethnic and cultural and historic and political perspectives. I can't think of anything more important than having people who are able to do those things. Uh, and uh, like um, uh, my colleague whom I've just met, it isn't just a kind of education that people should get in very selective institutions. The more we can make sure that that's part of college writ large and all post-secondary education, the better off we all are in being able to address those large national and social problems. So I guess the question is, is there anything left to say? <laughs> there's, a, there's a great line in a movie many of you may have seen called The Liberal Arts filmed at a relatively obscure liberal arts college in Ohio. Not, not, <laughs> not overly. Not overly. <laughs> not overly. 
in which the protagonist says, I majored in English and minored in history just to make sure that I would be totally unemployable. The fact is that what makes these institutions so precious in many ways is that it, it doesn't matter what you major in. If you believe, as I think most of us do, that we've forgotten all that perhaps 10% of the content of what we learned as, as undergraduates, what makes the experience of being at Oberlin for four years so memorable are the friends you made, the experiences in and out of the classroom, and the fact that we think you're adaptable and flexible and able to take on the four or five careers that the current generation will probably have to address after they graduate. When I moved from being a faculty member at Hamilton into the deanship, into what is nominally called the dark side for administrators, I started reading a bit more widely about higher education. And one of my heroes was James Friedman, the late president of Dartmouth, and before that, he had served as the president of the University of Iowa. And he wrote two wonderful collections of essays late in his life. One was called Idealism and Liberal Education, and the other, I think, was called Liberal Education and the Public Interest. And in the first collection, Idealism and Liberal Education, he had an essay called The Capacity of Imagination, in which he started off by quoting from Charles Dickens's novel, Hard Times, published, I think, around 1854, during one of the worst periods of the Industrial Revolution's late stages in Britain, in which the protagonist, with a great Dickensian name, Thomas Gradgrind, local businessman, was haranguing the local schoolmaster on what kind of pedagogy the schoolmaster ought to be providing the youngsters to prepare them for the new industrial age. And Gradgrind simply said, banging his fist on the table, teach them nothing but facts. Fill them with facts. Let them be vessels. Memorize. And of course, that's not what happens at a liberal arts college, where the faculty at Oberlin want you to question assumptions. They want to see you develop your intellectual and artistic capacities. They want you to question them, be skeptical of the information that they share with you. And if all the things that foundations want to fund that take place at colleges like Oberlin, such as student-faculty collaborative research, study abroad, experiential learning, the chance to sit at a laboratory bench with a senior scientist and do science, to be in a ballet studio or in any other area of the college and feel as if you're not only experiencing but learning the craft of the discipline that you're engaging in. That simply doesn't happen, even at great private institutions that are committed to liberal education, the scale that is such a problem in many ways for these institutions because they can't spread the costs of a faculty of how many, Marvin? Uh, 300, I think. So the faculty of 300 um, doesn't have 10,000 tuition-paying students covering the costs. It has an enrollment body of about 1,500 or 1,600. That's the problem in terms of scale, but in terms of what makes scale so precious and such an asset, it is that extraordinary ability to know that when you're in that classroom, whether it's 10 or 20 or sometimes a bit larger, you can raise your hand and ask a question or see that professor after class or during office hours and know that you're establishing a relationship. And as wonderful as I think many of the distinguished private colleges are and universities around the country that are larger, it's much more difficult to establish that kind of one-to-one -one relationship. But on the skeptical part of things, I do think that liberal arts colleges and their faculties have to guard against becoming institutions that aspire to being the larger research-oriented institution where the student's important, but perhaps not as important as the next article or the seminal essay or the experience to be on CNN or whatever the issue of the moment is. And that, I think, is a real challenge for all liberal arts colleges. So I think now we need to move to a more controversial question, although it was nice to see a little controversy. Um, and I think we'll start with Rick, you on this one. So 
there's been a lot of discussion in the news about the question that Jamie actually introduced. What is the added value of a college degree? And to that end, there is certainly a discussion of rating systems, and there are a lot of people who rate. Um, one publication is very well known, but there are many other rating systems. And I'm wondering what the panelists think about the value of rating colleges and universities regarding such outcomes as job preparedness and earnings. Do ratings help? Do ratings help if they should be pegged to a particular college or particular major? Take it away, Rick. Well, we live in a time when you can uh, look at your cell phone and uh, hit Yelp and decide what the best value for your money is for the best restaurant or carpenter or whatever else. We have means of technology to gather enormous amounts of data from large numbers of people with many different experiences and use that data to make, to make our own decisions. So I think any time that we have more information, that we, you know, in this age, we, we want to have as much information as possible and we shouldn't be kept in the dark. Now, the U.S. News and World Report says that the lead of its, of it, of its explanation of how it comes up with its ratings, that this is just a starting point, that no pieces of data can actually capture what it is to have an experience at Oberlin or any other college. So buyer beware when you look at a, a ranking and make, think that that is going to drive the decision for you. Anybody who wants to make this enormous decision about where to go to college has to be much more of a student of the choices available. And, that, and I do think that rank ratings um, can be valuable there. But as you know, Marvin, there's a perverse effect of highlighting any particular element and giving it too much weight because then um, colleges are going to game the system. They're going to try to figure out ways to look good on the U.S. News and World Report or other rankings that don't necessarily um, add to the overall quality of education for the individuals. So the other part of your question was, will ratings drive change? Will they drive quality decisions? And I don't think that any rating system will do that um, because the, the data is not ever going to be fine enough, right? So let me just give you an example. So Tennessee um, teacher preparation institutions, by state law, required to be ranked, rated, uh, on a bunch of different elements, and um, they're gradually improving that, but starting this spring, they're going to have individual data, data about individual completers of their program. And what that means is that three or four years out, you can see how well that teacher is doing in their school with some student achievement data, with whether they're be still in the field, whether a lot of data about that individual. Now, it's not about naming that individual. It's about gathering up all of this data. We live in a time of big data, gathering up all of this data and then being able to make some choices. So I talked to the uh, dean of college of education at Lipscomb University, and she said, you know, this is helping us make some decisions about how to improve our program based on data, based on evidence, and not hunch. And I think... Um, until we get that kind of individual student data that gives us these big trends, rating systems are not going to drive change because you don't know exactly what to do. Uh, it doesn't give you enough information as a program person to make choices about how to, make, uh, how to improve quality. Jane? Uh, the particular... Uh, focus that I have on ratings is that I'm working on the project that President Obama has asked the department to do, which involves ratings for all of the 7,000 institutions of post-secondary education in the country. Obviously, any comparison across 7,000 is uh, right there an enormous challenge. There are two parts of what we're trying to do. Uh, one is to help consumers make choices that Rick was talking about. And the other is to help use the taxpayer dollars that we're all contributing toward federal student aid to be used in smarter, more effective ways. 
Secretary Duncan likes to say that there's almost nothing else where somebody spends $150 billion the way we spend on federal aid mm -hmm. to students with so little accountability, with so little sense of what the results are and how different providers uh, are differentiated in how well they perform. Federal ratings are not likely to tell us a lot about the choice between Oberlin and Skidmore. That's not what they're really meant to do. Uh, in some ways, the consumer information will be likely to help people, some of whom are scared away by the cost of education, to actually see where they can in invest their time and money and their, if they're federally supported, their federal aid, in places that yield the practical things that they are going after. Do people graduate from a program that they're considering? When they graduate, are they able to repay their loans? Lots of Americans don't realize that for their income level, in fact, many of the schools that would be wonderful and challenging and appropriate for themselves or their children are in fact affordable. And so a huge advantage would be the, the Yelp-like consumer information to know that for me, for an individual who is thinking about that, that there are places that would cost much less than they feared, either because the price is lower or the real price to them is manageable, and that some of those places yield tremendous advantages in the likelihood of graduating in a reasonable period of time, the likelihood of working or income. We are trying to think about how we can provide information that would help people um, in addition to many other publicly available federal sources like the College Scorecard, the College Navigator that helps people understand the financial considerations that would also ultimately help us as taxpayers, as a nation, better target the resources that we are putting behind the importance of education from liberal arts education to very practical vocational education to put it into programs that actually deliver for people. Deliver in terms of the learning and the competencies and the skills and knowledge that they're looking for, in terms of completion and of leaving them better off, both to pay their loans and in terms of supporting their families and moving forward than they are today. Um, we're thinking of something very simple, um, just a few uh, different gradations or categories, mm. um, not rankings like 1, 2, 17, and 34, which were horrible. The admissions director at Skidmore used to say that the conversation, one of the conversations she hated the most was when somebody called and said, your school seemed exactly right for our child, but he or she also got into a school that's rated 13 places higher than you in US News tell me why it's okay for my child to come to your school. Or worse, my child is not coming to this place that felt like a place that would bring out his or her talents in the most effective way because we just can't turn down that school that's 13 notches higher. We don't want to replicate that. Um, US News has tremendous uh, shortcomings, including that it is, for the most part, a rating of institutional wealth not institutional ability to help people move ahead with their lives. Uh, so we've had a wide national conversation about the ratings that we are thinking about as a government to try and do the positive things, advance uh, access, uh, encourage institutions that uh, accept and take on and graduate with a quality degree, our lowest income students, without doing the damage that a poorly done rating system uh, could risk. Um, follow uh, our process. We welcome your comments. We welcome the comments of um, all of the people on the table here. But understand that we're trying to help people make both individual decisions and this enormous national investment that we want to help advance mm -hmm. access to schools like Oberlin, but also uh, the local community college, the state university, and to help people differentiate among the ones that are effective um, and the category of schools that do not serve people well. Thank you. Jean? Yeah, sitting next to Jamie, I'm reminded of a comment that I see after every appearance she makes, which is, thank God she's there 
to be able to weigh in on a conversation about a topic as incredibly fraught um, with respect to, I think, anxiety and speculation and uncertainty. So thank you. We, I think I, I appreciate it very much. I know that anybody in Marvin's situation certainly does as well. I don't have much to add. I'm grateful that I don't have to worry about this, actually, from the perspective of a college president. I still wake up you know, 11 years after leaving a college presidency at 3 o'clock in the morning on the night before U.S. News is about to release <laughs> its information saying, oh my God, where will we be this year? Um, but I do think, to Jamie, one of Jamie's points, that liberal arts colleges have a great deal to benefit from if the criteria that are used um, are able to, to lend much more light on the difference between price and cost and on the extraordinary availability of financial aid, which institutions like Oberlin invest millions in for all the right reasons, and yet there are still probably thousands of young people and their families who don't understand that th this aid is available. But the process, as Sandy knows better than any of us up here, often scares people off. You could say it a thousand times or 10,000 times in all your presidential letters and on the web, and until you're sitting down with somebody and being able to explain it, it is indecipherable to many families, especially those young people coming from first-generation college and disadvantaged backgrounds. So I hope that you will keep every bit of that optimism and equanimity as you sit around the table. I know you're hearing a tremendous amount of commentary around the country from people who are scared and nervous, but who also see the benefit of it. And all that we can do, of course, is rely upon good, sound minds like yours and Secretary Duncan and Ted Mitchell's and in the end, hope that the first version of it, at least, is given a chance to succeed because it has the potential to have the kind of impact you want to have it immediately. Just a brief comment. Um, I appreciate that confidence. It is a, a tall order. Um, there will be loops of public comment on what we're doing, so this is not uh, going to be a surprise. Everybody who has a thought about how we can do this effectively will get um, chances to look at it and to continue the conversation with us. Um, the one thing that makes me think it's worth the candle, as they say, is that people who advise low-income and first-generation students are among the most enthusiastic about our moving in this direction. For all the different kinds of information out there, there is still a credibility and a sense of responsibility about what the federal government does. And because we lead with access, affordability, and outcomes, um, and, and mean to be sensible and, and have values attached to each of those, um, the fact that the people who uh, talk to and help the, exactly the students you're talking about are among the most eager to have us do it um, makes me think that it is worth our continuing the effort to find the positives avoid the negatives and the risks and do this in a sufficiently contextualized that it's uh, matched up with the other non-quantifiable intangible things that Marvin and other presidents want to convey. Let's, let's let Sandy jump in. So yeah, because there's so much to, to respond to here. And I, I want to reiterate what Jean said, that we're certainly happy if this is going to happen, that you know someone like Jamie is at the Department of Education working on this. I'm worried not in the way that college presidents are worried, <laughs> but I, I'm mostly worried that, that we're making a big effort for something that uh, has little hope of really helping students, and particularly the students you're talking about. I mean, there are a couple things. One is there is a lot of information out there. The federal government already has a really good website where you can look up any individual institution and find out you know, how much the price is, how much student aid there is, what the net price that students actually pay is, how many people graduate. I mean, you can get all this information. It's not a ranking or a rating, but the information is there. What we know increasingly is that the way that people access and process information and the way that people make decisions 
is not exactly the way, I'm an economist, the way economists always have wanted to think. Well, you're going to gather all the information, you're going to make a rational cost-benefit analysis, and that's what you're going to do. The reality is that the students who need this information most are students who are so overwhelmed and so much at a loss that they probably don't even access it, and if they do, they don't know how to interpret it. And there's, so, so thinking about how to, to really give people personal advice is terrifically important. Schools are not good, I mean, like, you can't say this school is better than that school because it depends on who you are as a student and what you're looking for and what your needs are. And, and I think that one rating um, is, is gonna miss that. Actually, I think we're doing this because there are too many schools out there that are not serving almost anybody well. And these are not the Oberlins of the world. We're talking about a lot of the for-profit institutions where people pay a lot of money and borrow a lot of money and then don't get trained for what they wanted to get trained for. There are certainly private nonprofit colleges that are a question. There are a lot of lesser schools you've never heard of around the country that charge pretty high tuition, don't have much financial aid, are accepting a lot of students who are not very well academically prepared and, and causing a lot of problems for students. So it's not just the for-profits, but the reality is that we're trying to get at the schools that are below the line. And I think we should get at those schools. I think we should stop giving them federal financial aid. But the idea that we need in order to do that to somehow get every institution in the country some sort of a rating, I think is probably not the most constructive way to do that. And I would note that we haven't figured out how to measure learning. And so that's really what we're trying to get at. We think that people don't learn anything at some institutions. So I really think that we have to be very careful about this, that we have to figure out how to have more accountability for institutions, but not in a way that makes people think that we can tell you that this school gets a check mark or, or a check plus or a check, I mean, it, you know, if you're above the line, and as Jamie said, we're not gonna tell you whether Skidmore or Oberlin is better for you. So I think if we could acknowledge the segmentation of the market, and that there are some schools who, that really need to be held to task and others that, if, you know, look, if, if you want to pay uh, $60,000 to go to a certain institution, I, I suspect most of the people making that decision are, are using information and there's a lot of uncertainty, but that's really not what this is about. Rick? Just to say, to reinforce Jamie's point, that, that if you look at the scatter plot of, of the schools in U.S. News and World Report, the higher ranked they are, the um, more of their aid goes to affluent students. And the, the other curve, the other line is, the higher ranked you are, the fewer Pell, student, Pell Grant recipient or eligible students you have at that campus. So I wanted to springboard off that to ask Jamie a question of how can you design a rating system that is going to provide incentives for colleges um, to admit more Pell eligible students and to shift the merit aid that's going to affluent students to lower income students. Um, and if you can do that, right. I'm without write you a big check. Right, without getting too technical for people who came for the, the, the glory of the liberal arts. Um, the, the question of how to um, give weight to positive values like um, Pell enrollment or a wider definition of students, um, low-income students. I'm from California where dreamers are, where we, or nationally, but particularly in states with high populations of dreamers, we know that they're not included. So we want to come up with um, measures of mm what we think is access um, writ large. And it may well be that we do something that recognizes that some places have strong outcomes if you measure the outcomes that we have available to us, graduation, loan repayment, work, uh, work at, a, at some level of, of reasonable earnings, um, and may do a fine job of um, but may not be the places that are um, 
high access, but when somebody comes from those backgrounds, they actually pay a relatively low amount. There'll be other schools that provide tremendous access and opportunity and are very affordable, but the incentive we want to create for them is to galvanize the work that they can do to accelerate graduation if it's taking five and six and seven years for people to complete those programs. How can they get credit for what they're doing in terms of access and affordability, but pinpoint the opportunities for them to improve their loan repayment or uh, graduation rates. The critical piece about accountability and using the federal dollars toward the work that is most important, withdrawing it from the places that Sandy's referring to that, that are not of a good bargain in any way, quantifiable or non-quantifiable, from schools that are very poor performers, and moving it to places who have a good record of uh, accepting and providing completion and a quality education to the lowest income students, that's an expensive job. That takes a lot of resources. It takes, um, sometimes it takes remediation, sometimes it takes more advising, or working with complex you know, personal situations. And so if those people had a little bit more of the money that we have available, they might be able to do even more of that job. So we're sensitive to the differences of different kinds of programs, to not straight up comparing very wealthy institutions with a highly selective population and open enrollment institutions doing a very different job, but trying to be fair to all of them across the board. And I agree with what Sandy says about there's lots of different kinds of, and it, so it may be that the work that we do is most guided toward the accountability or the financial incentives and that the great amount of information that we and others already provide serves the consumer choice. Uh, just to reinforce what you were saying about how people use it, there's a tremendous guidance gap. Uh, when we talk about education and we talk about high school or people who are returning, uh, there are, in my state of residence, California, the ratio of guidance counselors it is 800 or 1,000 to 1. Um, at a data palooza that we had about how to use technology for all sorts of educational improvements, uh, somebody who was working on technological advising and, res and information management systems said that students at low income, students at schools with high populations of low income students spend about 38 minutes with a guidance counselor over four years. Think about your or your children's or your friends and neighbors experience with college guidance. That 38 minutes was for everything. It was a death in the family, a fight in the hall, a uh, need you had for a summer job, and co college guidance. So we recognize that there's a huge uh, differential in people's ability to get the information that would help them make smart choices as well. Can I just take an issue for a minute with, um, with the premise of your question? Because you started out by saying that the institutions that are the most highly rated give most of their money to the richest students. And the reality is that the institutions that are the most highly rated actually give need-based aid. The institutions that are less highly rated are the ones that are giving a lot of money to students who could pay without it in order to try to, attack, uh, try to attract them. The thing is that these institutions at the top, as you say, don't have that many low-income students. And if you're going to Oberlin, you have financial need, even though you are, by national standards, pretty rich. I mean, try paying $60,000 a year out of $150,000 income, and, and you, have, you need need-based aid. So it, it may be that institutions could do more, but I think we have to really think about, we live in an incredibly unequal society. The distribution of income is unbelievable. The guidance counselors that Jamie's talking about, the K-12 education system. So the number of students from low and moderate income families who graduate from high school ready to come to Oberlin is unfortunately, I mean, there are many who don't know that they could come to Oberlin and we need to do something about them, but it's not going to be proportional and Oberlin is going to end up giving, helping all the low-income students who come there as much as they can, but also giving a lot of money to people who by national standards are certainly not poor. And I, I think we have to be careful about how we evaluate the institutions 
in the context of this environment that is just not favorable to equal opportunity. On that point, Sandy, it, it seemed to me that the majority of liberal arts colleges probably below a certain number are in that same boat. That is, they, everyone wants to have diversity, understandably, to be a central component of everything that goes on on campus, from the students who enroll um, to the faculty who are in the classrooms, um, to the kind of multicultural themes that echo throughout the disciplines, not just in certain disciplines. And so one question I think that liberal arts colleges are being forced to think about is if diversity is a priority, what kinds of adjustments might we be willing to make in order to demonstrate in the most palpable way that having a certain percentage of students from first generation and disadvantaged backgrounds in the classes in front of, before our faculty and to have a faculty as diverse as we can make it, what does that mean in terms of all the other pressures that Marvin and his colleagues and all other liberal arts college presidents and their boards are trying to keep up in the air in terms of it could be everything, of course, from the quality of residence halls to the science buildings. I won't use the cliche that's used in every instance in this case, but you might want to shout it out at, at one point or another. It has something to do with climbing. That institutions have to really sit down and say, if we believe we want these values demonstrated, we have to make adjustments in the way in which we operate. And in my mind, the most difficult challenge facing the colleges who are f going flat out to provide the best possible education they have is finding a way to sit down with the constituencies on campus and their alumni around the country and really ask a, a set of very difficult and painful questions about who are we, what is, it, what is our mission as a liberal arts college and a liberal arts college with a world-class conservatory, and what does that mean in terms of the things that we will decide we can't do, we can't do, in order to achieve the goal that is of great, greatest importance to us? It's a very, very difficult question. I'm glad I didn't have to ask that when I was at Hamilton, but those, that was a different era. And now I think because of the, the changes in the economy and the, the long-term changes that this economy is having on the kinds of careers our graduates will have, those kinds of questions I think will be I think probably more in the forefront of conversations you're having at the board level. Well, we will be having a strategic planning process in the coming year, so these kinds of questions will be exactly the kinds of ones we want to be asking ourselves and, and our friends. Um, I want to shift a little bit to a very related topic, which is the high cost of education at a place like Oberlin, a place like Skidmore. Most of the selective colleges in America are all roughly in the same boat. Um, and I want to ask the panelists if they have any thoughts on, is it worth it? Particularly, is there a way to make it less costly? And if so, what are the things that we should be thinking about? Um, Jamie, you've had a lot of uh, time, so I don't know if I should pass over to Jean. Why don't I give you a, a breather? You've, you've been working. Um, Jean, why don't we, we let you take this one? This is a woman with two august titles, so we want to give her a chance to have a little bit of a brief. Um, the, your question, Marvin, is really what I spend most of my time thinking about, um, which doesn't mean that I come up with anything that's worth sharing with an overall audience. Um, at the risk of embarrassing myself, let me um, suggest two things that I think are worth thinking about. Nobody from the funding part of the world or I suspect in the Department of Education, thinks that a lot of what we might suggest will save money. But controlling costs, I think, is a realizable goal. So I have two favorite hobby horses, and I apologize for um, bringing them up to you again in, in this particular setting. But I know you share... You're um, invited. <laughs> you share my enthusiasm um, in varying degrees. One is, I think that Collaboration um, is one of the major keys to the future of liberal arts colleges. Um, I, I happen to believe that you know, liberal arts colleges are probably the most idealized and least understood 
set of institutions in all of American higher education. And Burton Clark, great late sociologist, once said that liberal arts colleges are the, the mystery and the romance. Well, that may be true, but the reality of it, I think, is that they all do so many of the same things. And when there is proximity, and when everybody wants to be teaching, <coughs> for example, Arabic, or wants to introduce hybrid or blended learning, how do we teach less commonly taught languages? Or more to the point, how do we teach under-enrolled languages like German? And I was going to say Russian, but that may, that may be picking up in interest. <laughs> but nonetheless, on all of those issues, there are opportunities for colleges like those who belong to the Great Lakes Colleges Association and the five colleges of Ohio to imagine ways of partnering and collaborating. There has to be a will, a collective will, and certainly that's where a funder can step in, but I think that collaboration is a key. And the connection, of course, is I also believe, and this gets to the edge of a later question you might have time to ask, that technology, as much as it seems an anathema and inimical to the residential experience and to what we call place-based learning, I think the real challenge facing great liberal arts colleges like Oberlin will be how do we integrate this kind of technology into this kind of a setting with the understanding that students who are coming to Oberlin right now have expectations and experiences with social media and with the web that is anything unlike a generation even 10 years ago might have expected in terms of access to technology. So with that input, and with perhaps the collective will of liberal arts colleges who want to find ways to control costs that will allow them to focus on diversity, for example, or having a robust study abroad program, or internships, or experiential learning, or a curriculum that is what we think students should be expected to be exposed to in the 21st century, that will depend upon using technology wisely, and I think perhaps most effectively in a collaborative manner. Sandy? Uh, well, I certainly agree uh, with everything that Jean said. I think another thing is that I mean, we sort of have this concept that every liberal arts college has to be the world to its students, and we have to offer everything that students could want, and we have great mm. difficulty cutting once things get implemented. And in the end, I think we have to say all the things we said at the beginning are the reasons why people come to a liberal arts college, and somebody said it doesn't matter what you major in. The reality is that you're choosing a college like this because of the overall experience, and maybe there's a class that maybe you could take online or in collaboration, and maybe you're just not going to take that class because it's people that cost so much, and we can't afford to have all these classes with five or ten students and still make this viable. And I think we're just going to have to acknowledge that we do some very important things, but we can't be everything to everyone. You've got to really think boldly, I think. I mean, think of the way in our very past few years, we've moved from our computers being PCs to being laptops to being iPads to being our phones. Those are very different business models with very different cost structures, and winners and losers are changing all of the time. I, did some research, obviously, looking at U.S. News and World Report. It struck me that the first 25 colleges roughly cost exactly the same price. There's a range from between, this is tuition and fees, from about 42 something, and that's really an outlier, to 46, uh, 46 7 at the top. And the mean is 45, 650. So how can it be that all of these different organizations in all these different parts of the country serving maybe roughly similar students, I would suppose. I mean, how could it be that it costs exactly the same to deliver that? And wouldn't it be the case that if a college decides to have a different way of delivering, a different way of delivering, a la what, what Jean was saying, that they would change that cost structure? And maybe that would be attractive, and maybe that would distinguish themselves or have a college that, you know, has some of these service learning. So in other words, that they differentiate themselves based on, um, you know, cost, but also other factors. Um, 
I, I just have to think that that, that that, but we don't think boldly that way, I don't think, uh, because we, we do think of liberal arts at colleges as the paragons of what college ought to be in some place. Jamie? And it often is. Um, let me pick on, up on the technology notion that people have talked about. Um, I think that the favor that technology and the dreaded MOOC mania uh, has given us is to offer us some important questions. And one of them is, well, how do we know if people are learning? Sandy mentioned learning outcomes very early on. And that's a critical part of the conversation. And when people started to imagine how a course could be given by a stranger far away, technologically, electronically, to 16,000 people at once, it was very natural to say, well, how would we know if they're getting anything out of it? What was the purpose of the class? How would we measure whether the learning that we hoped would take place does? And that has helped some people go back to first principles and say that about the traditional kinds of learning. Uh, let me take it into a realm that's even easier to think about, and that is law schools. I spoke here in New York during the big snowstorm in January to the Association of American Law Schools, and I said one of the reasons that it's, or the central reason that it's hard to know whether law school should be two or three years, a question about which legal academics can debate interminably, is if, this is a paraphrase from Alice in Wonderland, if you don't know where you're going, all roads will lead you there. If you don't know where you're headed, you don't know whether it's a two or three year drive to get there. So that's an example of a setting, but undergraduate education has some of the same, it is actually better off. I told them to look at undergraduate systems because people are actually trying, and I give a lot of credit to the Association of American Colleges and Universities and the people working on things like the degree profile, to say here are the capacities and for schools to then say this is about how far down that road we expect a person to be when we give them a bachelor's degree. And asking those kinds of questions will eventually be our way out of the credit hour, the four-year and two-year degree. Where is it written that it should be four years? Um, I'm not saying lop off a year to save money. I'm saying understand what it is we're trying to do. At schools different from Oberlin, where people are taking six years to complete their degree, there's an awful lot to be said for digging deep into what's standing in the way of their completion. Is it not offering enough sections of something? Is it that we lose people because they're too busy or their lives intervene and so maybe technology can help us with a reminder system about doing their homework or registering for class the next semester or the way we give out our financial aid might keep people on track to complete. And all of those have the potential to be cost savers. Now let me put on my uh, liberal arts college president hat and say, uh, this may be in the skeptic category, but there are things, I do like to picture liberal arts colleges as the place on the hill, the very best that American uh, people working together for the common good in the service of learning in a small community can be, and yet, maybe not at Oberlin, but there are places where that is challenged by some behaviors that both corrode the public perception. We want to think of ourselves as social leaders in all of those kinds of ways, contributing people to the leadership of our country. The degree of plagiarism, the fact that schools are re-evaluating whether they can sustain their honor codes because the students are not mm -hmm. honorable enough to trust each other. Uh, the degree to which we spend time on behaviors related to drinking and sexual violence are horrible for all sorts of reasons, but they also cost money. And I think that schools could think about how collectively they can convey both the value level and the very practical. We are spending money that we could be spending on diversity or counseling or working with our community, and we are spending it on things that no college ever wants to spend a penny on. And that's not, um, that's not isolated and it's not insignificant in the, both the time and attention and stress that it puts on institutions and 
that it, it's kind of an u a ugly little secret under the pride that we have and the best that we do when we are, are doing what's most wonderful about our colleges. Sandy? I, I just wanted to say that when we talk about the prices of all these institutions being similar, the prices are very similar, but actually their costs of how much they spend to educate students vary quite a bit. And so some institutions spend a lot of money to subsidize students more. Um, so, so Skidmore has a lot less money than Williams College does, and Williams spends a lot more per student than Skidmore, but their tuitions are pretty similar. So let me close by saying thank you all very much for being here. I'll be around for a few minutes, and I want to ask you to join me in thanking very much our wonderful, distinguished, and thoughtful panelists. Thank you.